We have here in 1 Corinthians a treatise by Paul on something that he did not at one time believe. Paul himself was the great persecutor of the church. The history of the church in the beginning is found in the book of Acts. And if you were to go back to Acts chapter 6, you would see that the religious leaders there are dealing with a man named Stephen. Stephen was one of the seven original deacons. And this man was, in chapter 7, is preaching a sermon. And he begins with that, the, the recitation of, of that which all the Jewish people love, the history of how God had delivered them and so on. And then in the, in the, finally, in the end, Stephen is stoned. And it tells us there that the men who stoned Stephen laid their garments at Paul's feet. Now, it may be that Paul had, we know that he had a thorn in the flesh, maybe that he had some kind of uh, disability that he could not pick up these stones and throw them at Stephen himself. But he guarded the clothes of those who did. And he was a great persecutor of the church. And then in chapter 9 of Acts, we see that the Lord Jesus meets Paul there on the road to Damascus. The road that goes from Damascus to, uh, excuse me, from Jerusalem to Damascus. That road is still there. It's, it's been blacktopped, it's paved, but it's the same road that Paul would have been on. And so the greatest persecutor of the church now becomes the greatest proponent of it. May I submit to you this morning that there is no such thing as a religious fact. You know, it's, it's a really interesting thing. When it comes to religion, people get kind of fruity. They get, they get silly. Uh, and I don't apologize for saying that. They get silly. And then they, they say things, well, all roads lead to heaven and all religions are equal and all that kind of stuff. Well, wait a second, folks. If God exists, and I believe wholeheartedly He does, He cannot be the God of all the different religions. He cannot be the 30 million gods of Hinduism. He cannot be the doubtful god of Buddhism. He cannot be the moon god of Islam. He cannot be the insufficient god of Roman Catholicism. He cannot be the whatever, whatever, whatever god of much of Protestant, uh, apostate Protestantism. He must, he cannot be the, 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 a Unitarian God of, uh, of Judaism and he cannot be the Trinitarian God of Biblical Christianity all at the same time. Do I, can I rest my case that this is all silly? There is no such thing as a religious fact. Uh, there, there, there's, uh, we, this, uh, there's an idea that was that's dredged up from, from Hinduism uh, we call it in, in Western philosophy existentialism. Existentialism works this way. No, normal thinking, I can't even think existentially. I, it, 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 it plays with my head. But uh, uh, normal thinking is thesis, antithesis. Because this is true, this is false. If this is false, this is tr if this is true, then this is false. All right? The, 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 Existentialism uses something known as synthesis, S-Y-N, S-Y-N means to put it together. Uh, when, when you undress tonight, look at your clothes. Some of them are synthetics. They're rayon or nylon or spandex or something like that. God didn't make those things. Uh, some chemists mix them up. He mixed things together, and that's synthesis. It's synthetics, we call them, all right? Synthesis means that uh, you take this and this and you put it together. Well, folks, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way at all. Uh, that, that's why you, you have many modern people that have a total disconnect between this being true and therefore if this is true, then this is false. They just don't get it. There's no such thing as a religious fact. Folks, either Jesus rose from the dead or he did not. It's that simple. In time, 
in history, on a certain time, in a certain place, on a certain day, he rose from the dead, or he did not. Now, Paul, the apostle, what we, the man we call the apostle Paul, or Saul of Tarsus, was a hard sell. He was writing on his way to Damascus to, uh, to apprehend certain believers and put them in jail, and eventually some of them would die. You make sure of that. And he's riding his beast of burden, probably a donkey, and all of a sudden, this, this extremely bright light shines down on Paul, and he falls off of his, of his, his donkey, and, and he hears a voice from heaven. Well, he knows it has to be God. He says, Who art thou, Lord? And Paul, Saul got the shock of his life. I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. So here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3, it says, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ, that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures. What were the Scriptures? The Old Testament. We could go back there and show you that. In fact, when Jesus was on the road with the two going to Emmaus, the Bible tells us, that he opened up the word, he, he told them about the prophets and all, and said, demonstrating to them that he was the Christ and that what had happened to him was supposed to happen to him and nothing was done outside of the will of God. And Paul said he died according to the scriptures. And then he was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That so there is the scriptural evidence, and then we see, we see testimony, and then we see of Cephas. Cephas is Peter. Cephas was his old name. That was his birth name. Peter is the, it was the name that Jesus gave to him, a stone. Seed of Cephas. Now, folks, let's understand something. These disciples were not looking for Jesus to rise from the dead. Now, how they missed it, I have no idea. The Pharisees understood that he said it, but they didn't get it. And probably they didn't get it because, you see, they were of the understanding that they would be, they would sit six on one side, six on the other side in the kingdom of God. That they had, uh, they had had the blessed experience that they were called, chosen to be the disciples of God, the disciples of Messiah, to set up his kingdom. So they didn't want to hear anything about this dying. That was not a, and, 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 and well, okay, he died, but he's going to rise from the dead. No, they, they missed that. May I say to you this morning that there, there among us here are people who miss important biblical truths because you're filled with your own ideas, your own anticipations, your own plans, your own life. And you're not listening to God. He was seen as Cephas. All right, then of the twelve. Of course, there were only eleven, but this is a title that was used to describe the disciples. After that, he said, as Paul says, he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep, or some have passed away. So this is years later, probably about... 30 years later. And Paul said, there are witnesses. There are witnesses. You know, it's an interesting thing. People can deny the most astounding things. There are people who are Holocaust deniers. They deny that the, the Holocaust occurred. One of the most horrendous events in history and one that is extremely well documented there were hundreds of thousands of there were thousands and thousands of survivors there were there were all there were people on both sides of this thing there were people that lived around these these death camps and yet people will just deny it astounding well, there are people who deny that Jesus rose from the dead. Now, let, let, let's understand something, folks. And, and this is very important. And, and I think we need to deal with people on, on this basis. Okay, you say it didn't happen. Then, then explain this. 
You see, it's, it's easy to be a naysayer. It's a little more difficult to come up with a plausible excuse. Why does the... the, the one of the things that demonstrates the, the truthfulness of the resurrection is the existence of the church. You see, Peter, James, and John had to be convinced that Jesus had indeed risen from the dead. Now, back around 1600, there's an Italian fellow that came up with the idea of something known as a swoon theory. In, in our own century, there was a, a fellow, I can't remember his name, he wrote a book called The Passover Plot, uh, using dr dramatizing this I whole idea that Jesus didn't really die on the cross, he just swooned. He just fainted. And uh, so then they, 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 they wrapped him up, they put him in the tomb, and, and you know, it was nice and cool in there, and, and and he got up and he left the tomb. And then he presented himself to his disciples, showing that he had risen from the dead. Well, that's all good if you're smoking something really strong. But if you're in full, full possession of your faculties, this is a lot of junk. First of all, they wrapped him up in these bands. And what they would do is, as they were wrapping, they would smear this stuff about a hundred pounds of gooey, sticky stuff. And the, the, the whole idea of these things were not to embalm. That's not, that was not a Jewish idea. The purpose of these spices were to do two things. To cause the decomposition of the body more quickly so they could take this body, put it in an ossuary, a bone box, stick it up on a niche, and dust this off and it's ready for the next person in the family. But... <clears throat> They wrapped this, they would wrap the body, they wrapped his body, they laid it on the tomb, they put a, a, a napkin over his head, over his face. So, he's going to wake up <clears throat> three days later, and how's he going to get out of that stuff? I can tell you right now, if we wrapped you up in that, you would die in it. You could not get out of it. You could not. So then he's going to get up. He's going to get out of this stuff. He's going to get up. Now, remember, this man's been on the cross. First of all, he was beaten. The, 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 the Bible uses the words, the term scourge. It was a horrendous thing. People that were scourged usually died from infection. When do you have to touch him again? He was crucified. <clears throat> so he, he gets up. Now here's this stone. It's a big, huge disc about this thick. It, 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 when, when I have seen these things, okay? When, when, they, uh, when they, before anyone was put in there, they just rolled it up a slight incline, stuck, stuck a wedge under it, and it just sat there. Then when they put someone in the tomb, they moved the wedge, it rolled down, and there was a depression. It would go back, it would roll down, and go boom, boom, rock back and forth. Well, at least five women came to the tomb wondering who would roll away the stone for them. Hmm. Now, anybody that has done a lot of different kinds of work understands that there are stances that you take to move things. And if you can't assume that stance, you are a great disadvantage. So what Jesus would have had to have done was reached outside of the tomb latch his fingers on that with one, maybe he could get two, and roll that huge stone back and get out. But there was another little problem, folks. There, were, there was a Roman guard there, 16 men. Now, four were, uh, there was probably four shifts of six hours each, but the others were close by. And th there was a rule in those things which the Romans guarded. If it gets away, you die. It gets away, you're dead. Now, you, you know, th th that was a great rule because, you see, the person guarding had no reason not to guard it with his life. Because if he lost his life in defending it, he lost his life. But if he didn't lose his life in defending it, he was going to lose it anyway. So he's, he's got to get out, overcome the guard, get away from them fast enough on feet with holes in them. 
And he must appear before his disciples on numerous occasions, not like a man that's got one foot and four toes in the grave, but one that is robust and strong and triumphant. You see, folks, the resurrection of Jesus Christ can be described in one word, victory. Victory over the death, over death. Now, you can't do that. Well, Jesus said, therefore doth my Father love me because I lay down my life that I may take, my, take it again. No man take it from me. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. One of these days, folks, and I don't know, and maybe the Lord will come back before, but one of these days, if he does not, death will come for you. And you know what you're going to say when death comes for you? Yes. You have no option. You have no recourse. There is nothing to, when, when the cold hand of death reaches in and takes our last breath, there's nothing we can do about it. Now Paul, in this passage, continues with the idea that I'm, he's essentially saying, I'm not messing around. I'm not kidding myself and I'm not kidding you. He says in verse 12, Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. If the Lord Jesus Christ did not bodily rise from that dead on that, that day, then we're wasting our time. We, we would be far wiser to just stay home on Sunday. Uh, he, he says... Uh, he, he, we'll, we'll go this in verse uh, verse 15 yea and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ whom he raised not up if so be that the dead rise not for, for if the dead rise not then is Christ not raised and if Christ be not raised your faith is vain you are yet in your sins verse 19 he says if in this life only we have hope in Christ we are of all men most miserable why should we, why should the Paul and all these other people live the way they did? For nothing. For nothing. There is no such thing as a religious fact. Either Jesus rose from the dead or he did not. And trying to dress it up in religion is as stupid as the fairy tales. Now, I like fairy tales. My favorite fairy tale is Rapunzel, because I've always liked long hair on girls. In fact, I, I dumped my first girlfriend when I was about six or seven because she cut her hair. Okay, I like fairy tales. I enjoy a good fairy tale, but you know what? I understand that a fairy tale is a fairy tale. I understand they're not true. You see, to a lot of people, religion is like. Whose fairy tale are you going to believe? And and and, 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 and basically, folks, if you, you know, if you don't like, if you like another fairy tale better than Rapunzel, wouldn't I be pretty ridiculous to rail on you and say you wretched individual? How come you don't believe in Rapunzel like I do? Oh well, Rapunzel, she's last year's fairy tale. I really like Cinderella. Oh no no no, Cinderella. And we, that's, that's the way they look at religion. And by the way, folks, they're not too far off. But do we all fit into the same category? Paul is raising the bar very high. He's saying to us, if it's not true, and it is true, it is true because I saw the risen Christ on the road to Damascus. It is true because Peter saw him. It is true because the twelve saw him. It is true because more than 500 all at one time saw him. People say, oh, it's mass hysteria. A mass hallucination, huh? You know what? 
You want to know something? There has never been a documented case of a mass hallucination. You see, folks, there are people who do not want to believe in the resurrection. Because if they believe in the resurrection, then Jesus is somebody very different from anyone else. And if that, it, 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 it is, his resurrection validates everything. And if he didn't rise, it invalidates everything. In verse 20 it says, Now if Christ, now, but, now is, but now is Christ risen from the dead, it become the first fruits of them that sleep, that slept. Jesus did not simply rise from the dead. Jesus raised other people from the dead. Uh, the, uh, there were other people that had been raised from the dead. They did not resurrect. They, were, they rose from the dead. We're, we're going to talk about the difference in just a moment. Back, Elijah raised a child from the dead. Elisha raised a child from the dead. The Lord Jesus raised the widow of Nain's son. He raised uh, Jairus' daughter. He raised Lazarus. Every one of those people were raised from the dead, but they were not resurrected. For you see, the, Jesus is the first Fruits of the resurrection. When he rose from the dead, something happened other than that he simply received his human life back. He became very different. Philippians 3 says, Who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body? In this same chapter, Starting in verse 51, he says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. That's a, that's a euphemism for the believer dying. You know, you went to sleep last night. I hope you did. And you woke up this morning. Now, if you died last night, you wouldn't be here. And probably some of your relatives wouldn't be here either, right? But for the believer to die is to, yes, we die like the world dies, but we will be raised. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. What is incorruptible? That means it's absolutely no corruption. None. Not at all. You know, as you're sitting there in your chair, you the cells in your body are dying. Remember when I was a kid, get all sweaty, and I do like this, you get those little brown rolls. Yeah? I don't care how white you are, you still get the brown rolls. Okay? I guess if you're brown, you get maybe they're a little bit browner, I don't know. But what is that? This dead skin. Thou hundreds of thousands, I don't know how many skin, cells in your body are dying all the time. And we could sit here in this room and not do anything. And after about three days, we go, what's that smell? And you say, ooh, it's me. All right? We're corrupting. Your body is corrupting all the time. I'm not picking on you, mine is too. In a moment, a twinkling of eye, the last trumpet, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible was put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the same that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Now way back in what may be the oldest book in the Bible, the book of Job, chapter 19, it says, For I know that my Redeemer liveth, that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth, and though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. But this is a different kind of flesh. It is an immortal, incorruptible flesh. And then Paul waxes into rhapsody where he says, Oh, death, where is thy stay? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? It doesn't exist for the believer. But 
thanks be unto God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Because he rose, I will rise. Because he rose, you will rise. But folks, let's understand something. There's more than one resurrection. There's more than one resurrection. Jesus put it this way. He said, there will be a resurrection unto life and a resurrection unto death. If we go back to 1 Corinthians He says, verse 23, but every man in his own order. This word order is a Roman term. It means a cohort. When, when you have a military parade, you, you, they, they don't just, just call come through. They don't even all just line up and get in their ranks. They come through according to what they are. In the old, in, in, in the Roman world, the spearmen came marching through. The swordsmen came marching through. The engineers came marching through. The sling thrower, the ones with the slings, they came through. The, they were the, the people in the chariots, they, they, it was according to order. Well, unfortunately, there's you, those that know the Lord Jesus who will be given eternal life. And there are those who will not. But the last enemy that the Lord Jesus destroys is death. Let me ask you something today. And this, this question relates to something that is just as true is the resurrection. I say, I state it again, there's no such thing as a religious fact. Either something is true or it is not true. Dressing it in some kind of religious garb does not make it true if it's not true. Nor does it make it false simply because we believe it as religious people. There is a resurrection unto life and there is a resurrection unto damnation. Judgment. A place of eternal punishment. And it's true. It's a horrendous thing. It's not something that I, that, that I, that I like. But it's nevertheless true. It's not something that we like to think about, but there is a point at which we do need to think about it. Because you see, it's very personal. I, me, I will live somewhere forever. You will live somewhere forever. What did Jesus accomplish by his death on the cross? You know, there's a, there's a huge chunk of Christendom that has this confused. Now you say, well, Pastor, who are you to say they got it confused? Well, read your Bible. Read your Bible. What, is, what does the Bible say that Jesus accomplished by his death on the cross? For, well, one of the things, and there's no, there's no great order here, but we'll start out. He satisfied the justice and holiness of God. How do we know that? The Bible says that we are just that we are justified by his rising. What does that mean? That means that this is, this is the symbol to all of humanity that God the Father was pleased with what Jesus did on the cross. Abigail played a, a song, it is, for the offertory, it is finished. When Jesus said that on the cross, we believe that it was not a whimper, it was not a whisper, but he said it in victory. 
In other words, the God's great plan for the salvation of mankind was complete. It was done. Amen. You, you know, every one of us, I hope anyway, but I would think so, every one of us has had that sense of completion. We have made something. We have built something. We have accomplished something. And we can say it is finished. And this is, this, is a, this, this is a statement of completion, of victory, of having achieved. And that's exactly what Jesus was saying. It is finished. What? God's method, God's plan, God's... Not, nothing that happened to Jesus, not one tiny little thing happened to him on that day that was not prophesied. Not anything that occurred that day was outside of the plan of God. And Isaiah 53, 11 says, He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. What does that mean? That means I can be redeemed. Did you know you can't be partially redeemed? You know, I would, I would guess that everybody in this room, now some people don't understand this, okay? But it's true. That everybody in this room had relatives that were slaves at some time. Now some people, somebody might say, oh, not white people. Oh, yeah, yeah. You ever read about serfs? You ever read about serfs? You know what a serf was? A serf was a slave that didn't belong to a person. It belonged to the land. And so when this serf had children, those children belonged to the land. And when those children grew up and they had children, those children belonged to the land. And how many rights did the serfs have? None. I could tell you things that are just too awful to recite that, that, that serfs endured because they had no rights. Now in the Old Testament, if you got what, too far behind in your visa bill, they could sell you, pay the bill, and you were a slave for six years. A lot of, uh, and, and now, however, if, if perchance you had a relative that didn't want you to be a slave, they could come along and buy you from the person. In other words, they paid your bill, then you were free. That's what we call redeemed. You know, folks, the Bible says we're redeemed. But you know what? You can't, you, you cannot be partially redeemed. My, use, my wife used to say of a particular, of any woman that was really great with child, she said, well, she's really pregnant. Well, pregnancy is a condition. You is or you ain't. All right? There's no such thing as being a little bit pregnant or a lot pregnant. You're either pregnant or you're not pregnant. It's like being you know, a lot of other things. Well, he's really dead, isn't he? No, well, you either you're dead or you're not dead. You can say somebody's really sick. And that's a condition too, but there are degrees of it. You cannot be partially redeemed, and yet the Bible says that the, the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin and redeems us. The Bible says we're bought. The, the, the Jew of Jesus' day understood this very well because they had, or they had relatives that had been in a condition of servitude because of debt. And they knew about that they could be redeemed. When Jesus died on the cross, God the Father looked down and he saw what his son had endured, both physical and and emotional, and mental, and spiritual. Oh, what he suffered was, was beyond any way that we could understand. For you see, I, I can identify with the scourging. I can identify, uh, I can understand the being nailed to the cross. But you see, Jesus, the spotless, perfect Lamb of God, was literally immersed. And all the filth, the sin of the, all of humankind 
from the first sin of Adam and Eve until the last sin committed. You know, have you ever been in a place where you just, Ugh. why? Because it was ungodly and you didn't want to be there. But he became sin for us. The one who knew no sin, that we through his suffering might have eternal life. But not only that, something else occurred there. Father looked down on that sin-bearing son of his and turned his back. You know what that means? The, 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 faith, the favor of the Trinity was denied to the Son because of my sin and your sin. And the suffering there of an infinite being was perhaps infinite. Biblical salvation is based on the very concept that when Jesus died on the cross, the Father was satisfied. You see, it's a complete salvation. It doesn't mean it need anything. You know, one of my favorite pieces of sculpture, and I've never seen it, but I, I, I would like to go there sometime and see it. It's called the Pieta. I first uh, noticed it with much detail when in, in my history of Sib book in college, there was a great big picture of it. And I looked at it and I said, how in the world could anybody do that to stone? Michelangelo, it, it, it was as if those bodies could just rise up and walk and move. It was, it was as close as per, to perfection as anything a human being could do. And there was a day, and, and, he, and, and Michelangelo was very particular. In fact, we believe that he destroyed some of the best sculpture that it ever was because he was not satisfied with it. But what if, what if, what if I were to go, go to, to, to Rome and in my pocket I had a little chisel and in my other pocket I had a little hammer and said, you know, Michelangelo was good, but we got we to make some adjustments here. Well, first of all, they'd arrest me, I'm sure. You see, it's finished. It's completed. God's masterpiece of salvation was completed on the cross. And he verified that in the resurrection of his son. And if Jesus did not die, and folks, Paul is not mincing any words here. If Jesus did not die, it's all a lot of nonsense. We close our Bibles, put them on a shelf somewhere, and go off and do whatever we want. You ever put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? The Bible puts it this way in John 3, 36. He that trusteth in the Son... It says believes there, but the, the, he, the Greek means trust. Everybody that thinks they're going to heaven is trusting in something. What are you trusting in? And I can tell you on the authority of the Word of God, if you're trusting in any kind of alloyed idea, anything that, it, that has Jesus and what he did and anything else, you put it in the wrong place. He that trusteth in the Son has life. He that trusteth not the Son shall not see life. Shall not see life. Shall not see life. But the flip side, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Why? Because there's no other way. Why is there no other way? Very simply, because there is no other way. Why is there no other way? Because there can be no other way. Why can there not be any other way? Because only Jesus lived a sin, sinless life and therefore could make atonement. Only Jesus lived in such a way that the Father could accept him as a fit sacrifice for our sin. Only Jesus. Amen. Fool yourself if you like, but you do it at your eternal peril. You say, Pastor, you're too hard. No, 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 folks. I'm not too hard. Sometimes the truth is hard. Did you ever think about the idea that truth is narrow? 
I remember when I was in school, teachers had those, I don't even know if they do this anymore, but they had these red pens, these red pencils. And they didn't make little X's, they made great big ones. And what does that say? Your answer is wrong. Why? Because it was wrong. Okay? Two and two is four. There's a, practically an infinite number of numbers it could be. But it's two and two is four. It, that can be demonstrated. We can actually do it. You know, we take two and two and go, one, two, three, four. Yeah, all right. The truth is narrow. People, people, another ridiculous idea of religion is that the truth is broad. Oh, really? Jesus said, I am the way. He didn't say a way, he said the way. The, that, that, the is what we know as the definite article. A is the indefinite article. He didn't say, I am a way. He said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes unto the Father except by me. You know, people, today people say you're a bigot. No, 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 folks. I don't, I don't believe. I don't believe in persecuting people because I don't agree with them. I'm an American. I believe you can. I believe you should be able to have the religion you want to have as long as your religion is not destructive. I believe that. Truth is now. If you received him, please give it very serious consideration. Let us pray. Before we do, everybody, bow your head, close your eyes. Does anyone but say, Pastor, I would like to know more about what you're talking about here. Would you just raise your hand? Nobody's looking around, just me. And I only do it because I have to. Let us close with prayer. Lord, how gracious and kind. You know, that, Lord, that there's this, because we've heard it so many times, sometimes it loses something. But how astounding that God who needs nothing and yet loves his creation so much that he would send his most precious son to come and give his life in a horrible sacrifice. Far worse than the sacrifices of animals, for they died in seconds. That we might have eternal life. Those that have rebelled against him, those that in many cases have maligned him and blasphemed him, and yet, Lord, you would do this. May this be an astounding revelation and may we not forget, and may we live with that thought foremost in our minds. Thank you, Lord, for what you have done for us. We thank you that you rose, and because you rose, we too one day will arise. And because you were, you you have an incorruptible body, an immortal body, so shall we. Bless the rest of our day. May we love you and serve you in Jesus' name.